I want you to know today that as we gather together, today it's an honor and a privilege for me to declare unto you that today we start a brand new teaching series called The Power of Prayer and Fasting. Would you say that with me today? The what? The Power of Prayer and Fasting. I believe that when we turn our attention to that title, that series title, to which we will be journeying on for the next few weeks, each and every week it will get more intense, more involved as we study and we prepare for the series that God has placed upon my heart. The three words that jump out at me as I look at that series title, the first word that jumps out at me is the word power. And Lord, how mercy we need the power of God today operating in our life and in our churches, the power of God. And I believe the power of God is made readily available to us when we get hungry enough to pray and to fast after him. I believe that prayer and fasting is essential for the display and the manifestation of the presence of God. I believe the power of God is as real today as you and I are sitting in this building. I believe that we serve a God that is omnipotent. He's all powerful. And thank God that we serve a God that there is nothing in this world that could constrain him if he so desired to show up and manifest his grace, his mercy, and even, yes, his judgment. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not serve a little God. We serve a big God. And our God is all powerful. Do you believe that? And I believe that when the church gets desperate enough that we see that in our own efforts that we are completely weak and that we are useless without him, that the complexity of life overwhelms us and takes over the comfortable position that we've assumed in the church and we get desperate enough that we say to God, oh God, we need you to display your power in this world and in our church. I believe that when the church gets to the place of the drastic effort that desires a move of God and God calls us to a place of prayer and fasting, then we position ourselves to see the manifestation of God like we've never seen before. As Brother Mickey has so wondered challenged us today that we are to join in with a joint effort of prayer and fasting for the next 21 days. He has went on record to say that we recognize and realize that some of you, because of your health conditions, cannot go on the diet that the fast requires you of. But he has said that you can restrict yourself from other things that may take your attention away from a time with God. Something like social media, that you would say every Every time that you feel the flesh drawing you uh, to social media, that you deny the flesh and you give that time to a time of prayer and fasting away from your social media. Maybe you would say to your television, that one-eyed monster that we all have in different areas of our homes and houses that draws our attention away from God and captures us with the one-eyed monster of the devil himself that we open up in our homes that we say we're not going to do that right now. But every time we have a desire to turn that TV on rather than focusing upon that, that we give our time to prayer and fasting. And Brother Mickey went all on to say, and it was almost blasphemous to make the statement in the deep south that you could fast away from your sweet tea. My soul, that's almost close uh, to being ungodly. But when we look at what captures our flesh and we say to our flesh, not today. We're not going to give in to the desire of the flesh, but rather we're going to give ourselves to the focus of prayer and fasting. I believe that today, ladies and gentlemen, that we're living in a world and a time to where we need to dedicate ourselves and deny our flesh and focus after our relationship with God. We're inviting all of you to join with us for prayer and fasting and again echoing what I told you in the beginning that we would pray for our nation. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a nation today that even though we may say on our currency and God we trust, it's almost become uh, the laughing stock of the world that a nation would have that on their currency, but at the same time say, God, we're done with you. We don't want any part of you. It 
It's hypocritical. It's wrong. It's blasphemous to make that statement when in reality that we deny the very existence of God and we reject God. The declaration that was made recently by some people that said, we killed you once, Jesus. If you show up today, we'll kill you again. My friend, what an ungodly, blasphemous statement that is. If there's ever a time that we need to receive our Savior, it is the day that we live in. And we're living in a nation of total moral decay and the degradation of what we're seeing around our world. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you would agree with me that this nation needs prayer. And we need to pray for our come to Christ crusade. And we, as I was in my intimate time with the Lord, God placed upon my heart just a few days ago that I am to pray for the church. The church, the church, the church, the real church. Ladies and gentlemen, the word is among godly pastors and men of God that I have consulted with all over this nation that we agree together that we're headed toward hard times. The church is going to be under severe persecution as you can see it unraveling right before your eyes as you look out in the crowds of the churches today where many people are living in fear rather than exercising their faith. When we look around the European countries and what's happened in the times past where the Wesleys and the Moody's and the Finney's made the declaration from the holy sacred pulpits and many people come to Christ in masses during their evangelistic appeals. But in today we see the churches that rather than running to the church, people are running away from the church. Thus you see, even in your own presence today, that there is a vacancy of people that should be here. Ladies and gentlemen, the church of today needs sincere prayer. Can I get an amen? When I look around our world today, I am disturbed by what I see, and the call of God that was placed upon my life is not an easy call. It all started back, and I take liberty today to give you history of how the Come to Christ crusade has been placed upon my heart and delivered unto you. It all started back in March of, or April of 2019. Did you hear the date? Or March and April of 2019. You do know that we're living in 2020. So I remind you that the burden that was given to me was not given to me in 2020, but rather in 2019, around March and April of last year. I've experienced it before in my own life in the past 40 years of serving Christ diligently and faithfully. I've experienced what I've experienced recently before in those 40 years, that moment, that season where the stillness and the quietness of my spiritual soul begins to be rustled about because the breeze of God's spiritual wind begins to cause a strong stirring in my spirit. Have you ever been in a place in your life to where God begins to rustle about inside you and the wind of God's spirit begins to blow on the inside of your spirit man? And because of that, you are made well aware that God is about to reveal something all well and familiar with these times when I know deep within me that God is up to something. Every time that God begins to move in my life and the rustling of the Spirit makes me uncomfortable. Thus I have experienced over the past four decades of my ministerial life within that still quiet moment that the rustling of the Spirit of God begins to up move in my life to the place that I know without a shadow of a doubt, God, you're up to something. All too well and familiar, I have experienced those moments in my life in the past 40 years of serving the Lord, soon to be followed by the still small voice that speaks into the depth of my spirit man that cannot deny this reality. Listen closely, God is speaking only to be shaken by this moment with an unusual burden that captures my soul. The burden for a real revival 
Yes, I've experienced before as God began to move in my life in history past that that spirit stirring of the Holy Spirit that urges me deep within my soul a depth that nobody could understand, a depth that nobody can carry, a burden that's well too heavy for a church or another individual to help me burden up. And I've seen that happen before when God begins to move and speak and begin to give me that message of the Holy Spirit that I'm about to do something. For many years of my life, the longing for an authentic revival has been real. A real move of God had burdened me to the very depths of my soul historically to the degree to search out kindred spirits around the nation that felt the same longing. Pastors that deeply connect with the Spirit of God. Pastors that are not just showmen. Pastors that are not hirelings, but pastors that give birth to the depth of a move of God in the spirit quietness of their moments with the supernatural move of God and the person of the Holy Spirit. I begin to search those men out many years past as God has begun to stir in my spirit only to look up and see the continual decay of our world and the seeming coldness of our churches, the callousness that is set in that seemed to be more consumed with itself than with a true relationship with Christ. The mandate of real evangelism and discipleship has evaporated out of the church of the living God only to find out that we have become calloused and comfortable sitting in our spiritual chairs and understanding that there is a lack among us only to realize that God would not let me off the hook only to be disappointed over and over and over again I would think maybe now God maybe now maybe now and kindred spirits that would be searched out all over the nation would be saying the same thing. God, maybe now, maybe it's maybe the time is now. In March, April of 2019, are you listening to me? Say amen. He captured me. He gave me an, a most unusual assignment, not just a revival. Not just a series of meetings where churches come together or people come together and with a degree of begrudgingly spirit that would say, oh, we're going to show up a few nights. But God said to me as he captured me, I'm not bringing you to a revival, but rather I want to give you a crusade mandate. As plain as I've ever heard the Lord say to me, God said this to me, I want you to organize a come to Christ crusade. Now, mind you, we're talking about in the month of March and April of 2019. I must admit that I was completely taken back with the request only to say to the Lord, when he branded me with this burden, only to say to him, God, you have the wrong man. Billy Graham does crusades. The late Dr. Graham is now in heaven. He's the man that pulls together the crusades. I'm not your man. And then God reminded me during that time, I have spoken. You have a choice, obey or disobey. And may I remind you that on top of that, I said to God, Lord, you do understand that it is 2019. Let me take you back, if I could, in that time of our life of 2019, of March, April of 2019, over a year ago, past we see that during that time, if you let your mind go back to April and March and April of 2019, you will quickly be reminded that people were busy. You couldn't even hardly get people to show up for church, much less a crusade and to speak of the subject of revival that was way too much to ask pastors had become very disheartened from the fact that when they would even revive would begin to to schedule revivals the church would not support it because that was a thing of the past much less the assignment of a crusade People are busy. Times were good. The economy was better than it's ever been in the history of our country. And the unemployment was at its lowest that it's ever been in the history of our country. And times were good. I, so I tried to shrug it off. Only the how the hound of the Lord of the Spirit of God, listen to me, are you listening to me, aggravate me more. 
Have you ever been aggravated by the Spirit of God? To which my spirit began to be captured by the thought, a crusade. A crusade. And then God spoke to me again and said these words, do the crusade. And as God began to aggravate me, and then he pressed upon me, not only to do it, but then he told me when to do it. As sure as I'm standing here and speaking to you with an audible voice, I heard God say to me, do the crusade, and then he told me when to do it. And this is what he said, do it October 2020. And I'm thinking, Lord, that's over a year away. That's way out there, God. October of 2020. Now, mind you, this was in April, March of 2019 when God laid this upon my heart to speak this. And then he said, do the crusade. And he told me when to do it. And then he told me what to call it. He said, I want you to call it Come to Christ. And I said, Lord, that's not very fashionable because we're living in a day that you need a real hook. And I'm not real sure that the fashion statement of today would be very appealing to the world that, first of all, we're going to do a crusade. Uh, what's that all about? Secondly, we're going to do it in October. That's a year and a half out. Man, things are good. Times are great. Nobody's going to come to this. And, Father, I'm sure that it's not going to be very attractive when we declare that the name of this crusade has come to Christ. Christ. And then he said to me, a final thing, have it in a tent. And I said, God, I understand that you want me to have a crusade. I understand that you want me to call it come to Christ. But Lord, having it in a tent is way off the chain weird. I said, God, uh, you know, we're living in the deep south. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to give God instruction of where I'm located so he understands what this is all about. God, we're living in the deep south. You understand we're living in the deep south. And God, you understand that typically, and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm not trying to do that. But I said, God, you do understand that typically in the deep south, when they're going to put up a tent, they're handling snakes or doing weird stuff. And frankly, nobody comes to that. He said, I said, do it in a tent. Wait just a minute. Come to Christ's crusade, okay. But most people in this day and age, God, frankly, won't come. October 2020, okay, at least that gives me time to plan under a tent. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think this is going to work. And I began to reason with God. I said, God, people will think I've lost my ever-loving mind. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to make fun of me. And on top of that, God, here's the question, how am I going to do it? And this is what he said, I'll show you. I'll show you how to do it. I said, God, how are we going to finance it? He said to me, I will provide. He said, I said, God, who's going to speak? He said, I'll show you. You must have this crusade, and it must be called Come to Christ. Take your pencil, write down three things he told me about the crusade. You need to get this. If you don't get nothing else that I tell you, you need to understand. These are the words that God gave me about the crusade. And I think these are profound words, and I want to encourage you to listen, and I want to encourage this to brand in your heart. When God gave me that, there were three words. I wrote them down, or three statements that I wrote down, and God said, you remember what I'm telling you, and I'm telling you this because you need to remember this. The first thing that God said to me is this. Write it down. The time is urgent. The time is urgent. I wrote it down. I said, God, okay, the time is urgent. We're talking about over a year and a half out. I don't understand it. Times are good. You want me to do a weird thing called a crusade? You want me to do another weird thing? Put it under a tent. I ain't got a clue. This is weird, but I'll write this down. The time is urgent. Then he said to me the second thing. He said, the time is short. The time is short. And then he said to me the third thing, and this was great. He said, the time is coming. The time is coming. The time is urgent. The time is short. And the time is coming. 
The perplexity of those three statements stirred my spirit to the very core of who I am. The burden became so heavy that I could not get out from under it. Unbeknowing to me that we would be at the time that God had gave me this in 2019 and the, the incredible heaviness and burden, the, the aggravation of the Holy Spirit, the movement of God upon me to confirm in my heart, yes, you will do it. Yes, you'll call it this. Yes, you'll do it under a tent and me looking at all this and un unbeknowing to me that we would be in a worldwide pandemic when it came time. I entered this assignment meeting with people, just talking to them, talking to pastors and preachers and people and confirmation after confirmation and here we are. I can tell all of you, here we are. Did you hear me? The declaration has been made. Here we are. What will God do? I don't know. But I do know this. We can't send the wind, but we can raise the sail. We can't send the wind of his spirit, but we can raise the sail. And I want you to know today that the sail is being raised. And if there's ever been a time in our life that we need to pray that God will send the wind of his spirit, it is the day that we live in. We dare not, we dare not compromise. Neither should we dare neglect the responsibility of raising the sail. It's the responsibility of the worker, the sailor, to raise the sail. But only God in heaven can send the wind. Ladies and gentlemen, my mandate and declaration to you is help me raise the sail and pray that God will send the wind. I don't know what the end result will be, but I do know this, God has spoken. I do know that. God has spoken. The title of the message today, as quickly as I can run through this, is simply this, when God speaks. When God speaks. When God speaks and you know that it is the voice of God, when God speaks, you begin to recognize and realize that there is something God is up to when God speaks. When God speaks, it demands the attention of those that are devoted to him. When God speaks, it requires that the church align itself with the voice of God. When God speaks, there is an eternal purpose in the spoken word. God does not speak to hear himself speak. God God speaks because when God speaks, it is as if it is done. Every time that you read your Bible, when you open the Word of God and you hear the message when God begins to speak, my friend, God uh, does what he says. Take your Bible, if you would, and open it up to the wonderful book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, many times this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at is called God's phone number, which we will give you in just a moment. The urgency of the moment, the demands when God speaks, ladies and gentlemen, we should listen when God speaks. When we're living in a time to where when you look around us, it should not surprise us at the decay of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, listen closely to the voice of your minister, the man of God that's making the declaration from the standard of God, the pulpit of God. It should not surprise us of the day and the declaration de of what we see happening in the world, the decay that's going on. It should not surprise us that this world is unraveling. Truly, we're living in the last days. When you see hatred as if it has never been displayed before. The homosexual agenda is on the rise. Attack against the church. Government involvement. Division like we've never seen in our nation before is now not on the horizon but living in our front door. Ladies and gentlemen, the church is under attack like we've never seen before. But what should we sit up and take notice of today? The world, the world 
word coming from the men of God about the end of time. Everywhere I look, every person I talk to that is a true man of God. I'm not talking about the charlatans. I'm not talking about the hirelings, but I'm talking about the true men of God that in the depth of their soul, they believe with every fiber that is within them, the end is near. That life as we know it is coming to a dramatic conclusion that Christ is about to return for his bride. We're living in not in just the last days, but the last seconds of the last minutes of the last hours of the last days. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, for you to get your house in order for the King of kings and the Lord of lords will soon appear before our very eyes. The word coming from the men of God about the end of time. All true men of God, are you listening to me, church? All true men of God are on the same page. Men of God are getting a consistent word from God like never before. And I never thought I would say this from this pulpit, but I understand what God is doing in true men of God. I'm not talking about the, the, the showman. I'm talking about true men of God. If there's ever been a time you need to listen, you need to listen now. God is speaking to men of God today through dreams. Men of God are seeing what's about to happen. It's a burden that we cannot shake. It's an assignment that has captured our heart that, that shakes us to the very core of who we are. In Jeremiah chapter 33, you see Jeremiah there in the word of God. He says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time while he was shut up in the court of prison saying, thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. Say it with me, church. The Lord is his name. Say it again like you mean it. The Lord is his name. Say it again, church. The Lord is his name. Can I get an amen. And in verse number three, he says, call unto me and I will answer you. There's God's phone number. God says, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things thou knowest not. Times were bad spiritually in Jeremiah's day. People were not interested. Nobody would listen. People would hate him. He understood the burden that he had received from God. It was a heavy burden that he could not shake. He understood what it was all about. He understood the condition of the world. He understood that he was going to get, go, go against the flood of immoral decay that was happening around him in the land of Judah. He understood that. Thus we call him the weeping prophet. You will notice in chapter 33 it says the word of God came to him while he was in prison. He he was put in prison because he was making the statement to the people, God's judgment is coming. God's judgment is coming. Jeremiah was saddled with that assignment to make that declaration in a world that did not want to hear it. They said, shut the man of God up. Make him quit. Make him shut up. We don't want to hear this doom and gloom message that this prophet has to declare. Only to realize that Jeremiah's message even though it was a doom and gloom message, it was right down the center of the will of God because judgment was coming. We're living in a world today that people do not want to hear the doom and gloom. We'd rather have preachers tickle our ears and tell us what we want to hear rather than what we need to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, I agree with the prophet Jeremiah. Judgment is coming. The wrath of God is going to fall upon this world as we know it today. See Sin has become darker. Man has become complacent. We've become consistent in our immoral cesspool that we are living in. We pride ourselves in the immoral mess that we're living in. We call ourselves right and we call God wrong. We're living in a time of trouble. The weeping prophet Jeremiah was cast into prison. Maybe, maybe we can shut him up in prison. 
Maybe we can cause him to go away. My friend, listen to me. You may say to the churches across America, and I say this publicly to the leaders of this country and the cities around our world, you may try to shut our churches down. You may place fear in the hearts of men and women, but God has given us the faith of a size of a grain of a mustard seed. And even though you may try to squash us down, the real church will rise like a mighty giant out of the ashes of this world. You will not shut us down, but we shall stand with glory in God in a time that the world needs to hear the message of redemption and grace and mercy more than ever before. Judgment is coming. The first thing to think about in this outline is the burden given to Jeremiah. The burden given to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a man not unlike any of us, flesh and bones, but yet only flesh and bones. A man to whom God saddled and strapped with a message that he did not want to carry. The dark days in the kingdom of Judah was dark as a midnight skillet. It was awful dark in the moral decay and Jeremiah's looking around him and seeing the total unraveling of what he saw as a society. The burden captured his heart as the Spirit of God spoke to him and you'll notice in chapter 1 and verse number 1 it says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Chapter 11 and verse number 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Verse number 13 of chapter 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying the second time. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse number 1, The repetitive message, the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Jeremiah chapter 33 repeats it over again. The word of the Lord came to me saying, all through the book of Jeremiah, you will hear these declarations made from chapter 1 all the way through the conclusion of the book. The word of the Lord came to me saying, my friend, the assignment given to Jeremiah was from the Lord. Are you listening to me? This burden that Jeremiah carried was not because of, well, are you listening to me? Say amen. It wasn't because of what he saw, but it was because of who he heard. The burden that was given to Jeremiah wasn't because he could look around his world and see the decay that was happening, the, the problems that was going around the world. It doesn't take long to look up from wherever your standard of life may be and see around you the decay that's happening around the world. It doesn't take long for you to lift up your eyes and everybody's got an opinion and everybody's got a response of what we see happening around the world. There are a lot of people that see what's happening around the world world and they are dismayed because of that as they look around at the destruction and the devastation that is happening. So many people say it's a sad day that we live in. Other people are rejoicing because they feel pride in the continual decay of what they see as standards that would keep them from living like pagans without any restrictions whatsoever. We see all kinds of responses from all kinds of people because of what they see. Listen Listen, my friend, it's not about what you see, but it's about who you hear from. The Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. As Jeremiah looked around the world he, that he lived in, he was vexed in his spirit that God had saddled him with such a burden. He knew the response from this assignment from God would not be easy for him to bear. The delivery of this assignment would be a burden to bear. When I think about a real burden that is given from God and captures a man or a woman or a church, will press them. Are you listening to me, church? Say amen. When you get a burden from God, you feel as if you're solitary in the weight of that burden. When God captured me in March of 2019, it has been an overwhelming weight upon my spirit. Yes. You may try to display that everything is well, but deep within the heart of a man of God, there is a burden that is too heavy to bear. It's a burden that's given from the Lord. 
a real burden that is given from God and captures a man or a woman or a church will press them to the Gethsemane of their spirit, only to release them as their lips cry out in total submission, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. There comes a time, are you listening, church, to where when a man of God has been summoned by God and saddled by God to carry the burden, there is a time and a place that you could talk to people from now till the cows come home. You could try to get people to understand. You, you try to get a com camaraderie built that, that maybe someone would help carry the burden, but nobody can help you carry that burden. That burden will press you to a Gethsemane of your spirit. And you will be in that Gethsemane of your spirit only to be released from the burden to when you submit and you say to your God, God, not my will, but your will be done. Listen to pastor. You will find the burden will become so consuming that you will find the only release is found in the closet of sincere prayer. That you understand that in the quiet solitude of your moments with God and you go through the Gethsemane of your spirit to say, God, if you want a crusade, I'll do a crusade. If you want it under a 10, I'll do it under a 10. If you want to do it in October 2020, even though it's 2019, I'll do it. Even though whatever, God, even though I don't know how I'm going to do it, how I'm going to pull it off, I don't understand all this, but God, if you said it, I will do it in the Gethsemane of the wrestling of your spirit to where you finally say, God, not my will, but your will be done, and you release that in the sincerity of the sacred moment of your prayer cross it then God gives you a burden and that burden is for you to carry God gave Jeremiah a burden that Jeremiah felt the weight of that he even said God why don't you kill me or kill them God, God, I, I don't understand. The weep, every day he got up and he wept and he cried and he proclaimed, even though he didn't want to, judgment is coming, judgment is coming. And the message from the pulpit today is, hey, you know what? The burden is here, judgment is coming. And then God gives them an instruction. This is what God does. God not only gives Jeremiah a burden, but he gives an instruction to the people. The instruction to the people is pretty simply profound, but yet profoundly simple. He declares unto them in Jeremiah 33, he says, it's summed up in three words. Somebody tell me, call unto me. That's what I want you to do. I want you to call unto me. What an invitation to know that the God of heaven opens up the gates of his glory and invites us to enter in and to commune with sincere and honest dialogue with him. He says, all I want you to do is tell the people, call unto me. Aren't you glad today that you can walk into the presence of God, that when you whisper his name, you've got his attention? Not as if we have today in our world. When you pick up the phone today and you make the call, you hear some automated voice that says, Do you want, if you want this, press one. If you want this, press two. If you want this, press three. If you want this, press four. If you want this, press five. If you don't know what the heck you want, press nine. If you would just hang on for the line for the next five, 95 minutes, somebody will get to you that will be a live person. Can I get an amen? But God says, when you call God, he doesn't say press one, press two, press three, press four, press five. He doesn't say, I'll get to you in 90 minutes. He says, you call me, I will answer you. Can I get an amen? God says, what I want you to do is call me. No one greater, no one more splendid. To enter into the Oval Office of the President of the United States would be considered to be equivalent to entering into a peasant's home compared to calling out to God and entering into his glorious presence when you call unto him. What does God say as Jeremiah is given this burden? He says, Jeremiah, tell the people to call unto me. 
Ladies and gentlemen, my commission to you today as we enter into 21 days of prayer and fasting, never has there been a time that we need to call unto the Lord that's more urgent than the day that we live in today. Pastors all over the nation, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm not telling you this because it's something that I've dreamed up, but pastors all over the nation that are conservative, Bible teaching, anointed pastors are saying the same thing. And that is the month of September and October is going to be terrible. That we're running into a time of September and October that's going to shake us to the core. Pastors all over this country are saying the same thing. You have a short season to pray. That all of a sudden when we walk into the fall of this year, we believe with all of our heart we're not predictors. We can't dictate things, but we believe with all of our heart consistently and collaboratively together that we're going to go into unprecedented times. If there's ever been a time that we need to call on to the Lord, it's the day that we live in today. A time that we need God's anointing and God's unction. A time that we need men of God with the anointing of God, with the unction of God to preach the word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we need God to do a work that only he can do. The urgency of the moment is requiring us to pray. And Then thirdly, he gives us a promise. The promise is extended from God to all of us. And this is the promise from God, call unto me and somebody tell me, I will answer you. What an incredible promise that is from God. If you will call me, I will answer you. Ladies and gentlemen, God has given the burden. God has commissioned us to pray. And I believe that if we will pray, he will answer us. I believe that we need to pray today like we've never prayed before. I believe that we need to enter into a season of prayer, not just casually, but we need to enter into a season of prayer that has captured us. God says, if you pray, I will answer you. I will answer you. You say, Brother Jackie, I'm not really interested in a crusade. I'm not really interested in this. For God's sake, if you're not interested in it for yourself, do you not care for your children? Do you not care for your grandchildren? God has spoken to me and said, you know what? The older generation has become spoiled. Your desperation has not pushed you to him. We've had it made in America. But your children and your grandchildren is going to face a different world than you knew. It's not time to stay away. It's time to run to him. It's not time to become rigid in our religion, but it's a time to become broken in our faith. The bottom line is profound to me. I wished I had time, but due to the regulation of time, there's so much I need to tell you. Hopefully you'll come back the next few weeks and listen. God has spoken. And now I invite you to join with me for the next 21 days for a time of fasting and prayer. Oh, how I wished I had the, the ability and the eloquence to be able to deliver to you the urgency of the time that we live in. If I could, I believe it would shake you to the core. But thus I realize and understand that, that it's not my job to do that. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Yes, God has given a burden, not just to me, but to other pastors that see what's happening. The consult, the collaboration of men of God agree together. Judgment is coming. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, 
I beg of you, come to know him before it's too late. If you've been playing games, you need to get over the games. You need to come and get real with God. If you have religion, but you don't have a relationship, you need to, you need to run to him. If your spirit has become calloused and cold because you've been going through a form of godliness, but you have forgotten the power thereof, you need to be broken before him in the Gethsemane of your spirit that would press you to the urgency of prayer. If you've lost your cry for the lost, you need to pray that God would rebirth in your spirit a cry for lost people. If you've lost the lens of eternity out of your eyes, you need to pray that God would fasten your eyes with eternity. If you've lost the urgency to bow at an altar and pray, you need to ask God to renew that. We're entering into a time of prayer and fasting. I cannot do that for you, but I can compel you to do it. So today, I wanted to remind you that the altar is open. I want to remind you that if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, we have people ready and willing to pray with you. If you're looking for a church home, this is your place. We have people that are praying for you. I think that so many people have got confused because we, uh, the way we do in the altar call. If you are here and you would like for, to ask Jesus in your heart, I'm going to invite you to come and go right here. They're going to... They're going to take you over there and they're going to spend some time with you in prayer. If you're here and you're looking for a church home, I want you to go right there. They're going to take you over there and get some information. But if you just want to come to an altar and pray, this altar is open for you as we stand together and as we sing. This is your time before the Lord. You pray and you open. On behalf of our pastor, thank you for joining us today. We'd love to pray with you. One of our prayer counselors is available to pray with you right now. Please call us at 205-753-1875. And again, thanks for joining the exciting Eden West Side. And don't forget to join us online tonight for tonight's message.